Please be advised that this content is for mature audiences only. Sid Vicious, whose real name is John Simon Ritchie, was arraigned today on charges of murder. He said he felt sick. His manager was told bailing him out pending trial would be extremely difficult. He's an alien, he's not employed, and he's given to violent outbursts of temper. But his manager said, and I quote, underneath that tough exterior, there was a real nice guy. An interview with Sid and Nancy. Yeah. Sid and Nancy at home. Here's the lovely look. On the morning of 12th of October 1978, Vicious claimed to have awoken from a drug stupor to find Nancy Spungen dead on the bathroom floor of their room in the Chelsea Hotel, Manhattan, New York. She had suffered a single stab wound to her abdomen and apparently bled to death. On the 22nd of November 1978, Sid Vicious was arrested and charged with the murder of Nancy Spungen. Vicious said they had fought that night but gave conflicting versions of what happened, next saying I stabbed her but I didn't mean to kill her, then saying he didn't remember and at one point arguing Spungen had fallen onto the knife. Vicious was released after his mother posted the $50,000 bell. How did this whole thing happen? Do you, do, you, do you look back and think to yourself how did it happen? Yeah. And what do you think made it happen? It was meant to happen. Nancy always said she'd die before she was 21. <coughs> what would you like to happen now over the next, say, year or two? I'd like to have fun. What sort of fun? Any kind of fun, just fun. That's my object in life. Are you having fun at the moment? Are you kidding? Oh, I'm not having fun at all. Ten days after Spungen's death, Vicious attempted suicide by slicing his wrist. Where would you like to be? Under the ground. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. It was on February 1st, 1979, when Sid Vicious was found dead having overdosed on heroin, believed to have been bought by his mother. Rock star Sid Vicious is dead after taking an overdose of heroin last night. Police say his death was an accident. A poem about Nancy was found on a piece of paper in his pocket. It was not until after his funeral that his mother found Sid's suicide note inside the pocket of his jacket. It was written on a small piece of lined paper and written in shaky block capitals on both sides was his note. Sid Vicious will not have to stand trial for the murder of a girlfriend at the Chelsea Hotel. Sid is no longer vicious, he's dead. 
His nude body found in a Greenwich Village apartment, spoon and syringe nearby. Welcome to Cracklin' Rosie True Crime. If you like true crime presented in a respectful and mindful way, please consider subscribing to our channel. Before we get into the let's discuss or the commentary portion of this video, I'd like to bring up two very important points. The first, Nancy Spungen suffered from mental health her entire life. It was a day-to-day -day battle for her and while I was doing my research, I came upon all this sensationalized media that talked about drugs and partying and music, punk rock, the New York scene, the London scene, and all that stuff has its truth. But let's remember that there's a big underlying issue here of mental illness. We need to break the silence and stop the stigma with regards to mental health. The second issue that I would like to share is that during my research, I stumbled upon a radio interview with Deborah Spungen, who is Nancy's mother. She provided details from a mother's perspective, the mother of a murder victim. I'm not gonna play the video because it was about 45 minutes, but I will put the link in the video description and I highly recommend that you listen to it. Please keep in mind that there may still be people alive and well who still suffer trauma from the events. Let's just always be kind folks. And with that, let's move on to the commentary. So let's talk about the details of this case. I'm going to share an article with you. I'm not going to share it on screen because it's just so hard to read, but I will be referencing all of my research materials in the description of this video. Nancy Laura Spungen was born February 27, 1958 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She was the eldest of three children. She had a younger brother, David, and a younger sister, Susan. Her parents, Frank and Deborah, were a middle-income Jewish couple. At birth, Nancy nearly died of oxygen deprivation from having the umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. 
Doctors determined, though, that the baby had not suffered brain damage. She was allowed to go home in about eight days. Nancy was an incredibly bright, but very disturbed and angry child. She screamed throughout her infancy, leading one pediatrician to prescribe liquid barbiturates at three months of age. As she grew older, she began to demonstrate acts of violence against her younger sister, and once she threatened the babysitter with a pair of scissors. Her first suicide attempt occurred at the age of 14. A year later, Nancy was diagnosed with schizophrenia, but she was soon accepted to the University of Colorado at Boulder at just 16 years of age. During her first year of college, she was arrested twice for stolen property in her dorm room and for purchasing marijuana from an undercover cop. She was booted out of school and her father came to take her back to Philadelphia. At 17, Nancy left home for New York City, where she immersed herself in the punk rock music scene. She met Debbie Harry of Blondie, Jerry Nolan of the New York Dolls, and other rock stars while supporting herself as a stripper and sex worker. When Nolan and his band, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, took off for a tour of London, Nancy hopped on a plane and moved to the UK to be near her idol. Nolan reportedly wanted little to do with Spongin, however, so she set her sights on another band, the Sex Pistols. Undisputed court jesters of England's righteous punk scene. A flirtation with singer Johnny Rotten went unrequited, which led Nancy to take up with the band's bass player, Sid Vicious, instead. Sid Vicious was born Simon John Ritchie on May 10, 1957 in London. His father was a jazz musician who worked as a guardsman at Buckingham Palace and his mother was in the army. When Sid was an infant, his mother Anne took him to Ibiza. Her husband failed to join them, so she divorced him and married another man, Christopher Beverly. Just six months later, Sid's stepfather died of cancer. Anne, who was already using drugs by that point, began to deal. She turned her son into a tiny drug mule, smuggling hard narcotics between Spain and England, hidden on the child during several trips. Eventually, mother and son moved to a flat in East London. Sid not only witnessed his mother's drug use and that of her friends, but he may have done drugs as a teen with Anne. Young John Beverly, as he was known, attended Kingsway College of Further Education in Holborn, Central London, where he made friends with three other Johns. John Wardle, later known as bass player Ja Wobble, John Gray, and a working class kid from North London named John Lydon. Lydon gave John Beverly his famous nickname, Sid Vicious, coining the name after his pet hamster, who was apparently a rather vicious little critter. John Lydon, under the name John Ro Johnny Rotten, later became the singer of the Sex Pistols, one of the first punk bands in the UK, managed by Malcolm McLaurin. The Sex Pistols had a legit bass player, but apparently the other guys in the band thought he was too straight looking to play the punk clubs. So in 1977, they booted him out with McLaurin's urging and hired Sid instead. Sid Vicious had done a little drumming. He played drums for Susie and the Banshees first gig in September 1976, but had to learn to play the bass, which he never really did well. Really, Sid's role in the Sex Pistols was his look and his attitude. From his self-cut spiky black hair to his edgy clothing, including studded belts and Nazi emblems, to the in-your-face attitude he presented both on stage and off, Sid was certainly something to behold. At times he appeared to be an enthusiastic joker, at other times he seemed downright mentally disturbed. But when Sid and Nancy got together, they created an especially dangerous and combustible cocktail. Nancy, like Sid's mother's Anne, was an addict who used highly addicting opiates 
like heroin. Sid began using heroin with nauseating Nancy as she was coined, and his public performances began to degenerate. During the Pistols' only American tour in January 1978, Sid was completely wasted, missing Nancy, who McLaurin banned from joining them on the tour and made an utter fool of himself. He spat blood on one concert goer, struck another audience member in the head with his bass guitar, attacked a photographer and a security guard, and carved the words, give me a fix on his chest using a safety pin. The other Sex Pistols were sick of Sid sucking up all the attention and being a lousy musician to boot and kicked him out of the band. Vicious then recorded three songs from McLaurin's film, The Great Rock and Roll Swindle, about the Pistols, including a cover of Frank Sinatra's My Way. He and Nancy soon flew to New York to begin working on his solo career. Nancy managed to get Sid booked for several gigs at Max's Kansas City. There was plenty of interest in Vicious, but not much revenue coming in in those gigs. To supplement their income, Nancy returned to sex work while they waited for royalties from his swindle songs to pay off. They finally received some of that money in October 11th, 1978, the day before Nancy's dead body was found in their hotel room. Sid and Nancy spent most of their time using drugs, trying to score, and occasionally practicing music, fighting with each other during the months they lived at the Chelsea. Their drug use had spiraled into depression and they frequently made suicide packs, promising to kill themselves together if it got too bad. Nancy even bought Sid a knife, known as a 007 knife, one that Sid had also seen on rock star Stiv Bader's and admired. Nancy had been calling McLaurin in London for months, screaming about Sid's royalties from My Way, the only one of the three singles released thus far from the great rock and roll swindle. Finally, on October 11th, she received a check from London and cashed it. She and Sid bought a large quantity of Tulanol, which are barbiturates, and other drugs before returning to the Chelsea. Nancy kept the money close, wrapped in a purple hair tie, and that will be important. I'm going to share a little clip at the end of my commentary. At 9.45 that evening, Sid and Nancy went to room 119 to visit friends Kathy O'Rourke and Neon Leon. Nancy told a couple to come to their room and enjoy some of their new drugs. She and Sid left room 119 around midnight. Leon and Kathy did not come to room 100, but other friends stopped by to party. Several noted that Sid was passed out on the bed unconscious. He'd taken too many to and all. They also remembered Nancy holding the wad of cash wrapped in the purple hairband. One of their friends remembered seeing a man named Michael a gay club kid with long hair hanging around at the time. Hours later, he saw Michael again at the Chelsea with what appeared to be a purple hairband or scrunchie. At 2.30 a.m., Nancy called Rocket's Red Glare, true name, Michael Mara, a drug addict and character actor, to ask him to bring synthetic morphine along with hypodermic needles. She and Sid then went down to the hotel lobby to wait. They returned to their room before Rockets arrived. At 3.15 a.m., Rockets' red glare arrived at the Chelsea and went to room 100. He found Nancy there wearing a long t-shirt over black underpants and Sid asleep on the bed. Red Glare did not bring the drugs and paraphernalia Nancy requested, and he left before 5 a.m. During the roughly one hour and 45 minutes he spent in the room, Nancy was reportedly very agitated about not getting the drugs, and occasionally Sid would rouse himself from his drug-induced stupor. Nancy and Red Glare also discussed him becoming a bodyguard on Sid's upcoming tour. Down in the lobby, Rockets made a phone call from the front desk where he saw a man he knew as Stephen C. walk in from the street. 
Stephen, Rocket's new, regularly dealt quaaludes and two and all to Sid and Nancy. After his call, Rockets left the Chelsea Hotel. At 5 a.m., the guest in room 228 phoned the front desk to complain about a man knocking at his door, waking him. The bellhop went up to the second floor to investigate and found Sid wandering around. Vicious seemed agitated and unruly, but rather dazed. He tried to punch the bellhop who wrestled him down to the ground and subdued him. Sid with his mouth bloodied, then headed to the stairs, presumably to return to his room. Just before 7.30, the guest in room 102 next to Sid and Nancy heard moaning sounds coming from next door. It was a woman's voice. The guest later said it sounded like the woman was alone. The sound stopped after a while and the guest returned to sleep. At 9.30 a.m., the front desk received a call from outside the hotel warning that there was trouble in room 100. The staff member who took the call then sent the bellhop up to the room to investigate. The bellhop did not immediately go to room 100. At 10 a.m., someone called the front desk from the room and a man's voice said, someone is sick, needs help. At 10.45, ambulance and police arrived from the nearby 10th precinct. They discovered Nancy's body in the bathroom slumped against the wall between the toilet and sink. An autopsy noted that Nancy had several bruises and contusions on her body, including two bruises on her face. Friends claim Nancy told them that Sid beat her over the head with a guitar, but the cause of death was blood loss due to a single penetrating knife wound to the abdomen. Sid Vicious was not in room 100 when the bellhop arrived and called police. He was found instead staggering around outside in the hallway, crying. He was very clearly still high from the previous night's drug binge. When police began to question him, he initially said that Nancy must have fallen on the knife. Sid was escorted out of the Chelsea Hotel by police and taken to a local precinct for questioning. He allegedly told them that he killed Nancy and that he did it because he was a dirty dog. After being questioned for several hours, he was arrested. But police did not investigate the stories of other people visiting room 100, including the many other fingerprints that would have been easily acquired. Some of Sid and Nancy's guests that late night included known drug dealers and others with criminal records who would have been easy to identify by fingerprint. Instead, investigators were satisfied that Vicious alone had stabbed Nancy. After all, they shared the hotel room, the murder victim belonged to him, and he not only seemed to know that Nancy was dead, but even admitted to them that he did it. There were also multiple statements from associates that Sid had been abusive with his girlfriend. But did he murder her? If so, was it intentional or in his drug-induced stupor? Had Sid accidentally killed Nancy? Was this part of some twisted suicide pack and he couldn't finish the job? Or did the rock star wake up after a night of partying only to discover his girlfriend dead? Sid was booked and taken to jail, but soon bonded out thanks to a generous $50,000 investment from Virgin Records owner Richard Branson and a fancy attorney whose legal fees were paid by singer Mick Jagger. Sid even got a few days in lockup to detox from the drugs, but when friends saw him at Max's Kansas City after his release, he was again loaded to the gills and distraught. On October 22nd, 10 days after Nancy's murder, Sid attempted suicide using a broken light bulb and he was sent to Bellevue Hospital. During the ambulance ride, he kept screaming, I want to die. 
After a few days at Bellevue, Vicious was released and staying with friends in the city. He met a young woman, Michelle Robinson, and the two began dating. But at a concert, Sid got into an altercation with singer Patti Smythe's brother, Todd, and he smashed a broken beer bottle into Todd's face. His bond revoked. Sid got arrested again and sent to Rikers Island Maximum Security Jail, where he spent the next two months. When Vicious arrived at Rikers, he was immediately put into their drug detox program. But we also have recently learned that while at the maximum security facility, Sid was gang raped. It is an important factor to consider when you examine what happened next. Sid was released from Rikers on February 1st, 1979. He would still be facing a potential trial for Nancy's murder, and he joined his girlfriend Michelle at her New York apartment. His mother, Anne, was also in New York awaiting her only child. That night, Sid and his friends gathered to celebrate his temporary freedom. Vicious was sober that day, having successfully completed his Rikers mandated detox program. But within hours, a friend brought him some heroin. It was too much. His body was no longer used to the drug and at midnight, Sid overdosed. He got lucky. His friends were awake and they rallied around him and revived the musician. Allegedly, immediately after waking from the overdose, Sid begged for more heroin. It seems clear that he was tempting fate. Was he worried about the trial, fearing a guilty verdict and a life or death sentence? Or was he more afraid of being returned to a maximum security facility like Rikers, where he had been violently assaulted just weeks before? During the night, he managed to get hold of more heroin, and he asked his mother, Anne Beverly, a seasoned addict, to help him. She did. Anne gave her son another dose of junk just hours after he'd overdose. It was enough to kill him. Sid Vicious was found in the morning lying beside his girlfriend. He died during the night. Anne Beverly, who killed herself in 1996, told a friend of Sid's, Jerry Only, the bassist for the punk band The Misfits, that she deliberately gave her son an overdose. She knew that he was terrified about being raped again in prison and wanted to spare Sid the indignation of a trial, sentence, and torture in prison. Jerry Only was, on, was also the one who drove Sid's mother to pick up Vicious's ashes after he was cremated days later. Anne told Only and others that in the days after her son was cremated, she discovered a suicide note in his pocket. It confirmed to her that he did not want to keep living, justifying her decision to end his suffering herself. Friends then took Sid's ashes to the Philadelphia Cemetery where Nancy was buried and against her family's wishes, sprinkled them over the grave. I read that that may or may not be true, so We'll just say an allegedly there. We may never know the truth of how Nancy Spungen died. Was it murder-suicide, just suicide, an accident, or intentional homicide? Was her death at the hands of the man she loved or someone else? We also don't know what became of the money she collected the day before, the cash that was wrapped in that purple hairband. It was not collected from her hotel room during the investigation. Police never questioned Stephen C., the dealer seen in the lobby the morning Nancy died. And the man known as Michael has never been identified. Rocket's red glare did brag, however, to several friends that he was the one who killed Nancy. Rocket's true name, Michael Mara, is also deceased now.
Rocket's Red Glare was known for being a stand-up comedian and character actor who appeared in over 30 films over a span of two decades. His credits include the films Desperately Seeking Susan, After Hours, and Big. But in addition to this, Red Glare is known for something else, something more sinister, and it all took place at the legendary Chelsea Hotel in the fall of 1978. Rockets was known in the late 70s punk scene as a roadie for the Hassles, a band featuring a young Billy Joel, but also as the bodyguard and supplier for former sex pistol Sid Vicious, who in 1978 was living in room 100 of the Chelsea Hotel with his girlfriend Nancy Spungen. One morning in the fall of 1978, Vicious claimed he had woken up to discover the body of Nancy underneath the sink in their suite at the Chelsea. Sid was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Ultimately, the case was closed without resolution after the body of Vicious was found in February of 1979. The cause was determined to be an overdose. But Vicious was not the only suspect in the death of Spungen. The second suspect was Rocket's Red Glare. Many of the people in the punk rock scene and others who knew Sid and Nancy believe that it was in fact Red Glare who was the one responsible for Nancy's death. Red Glare was accused of Spungen's murder by journalist Phil Strongman in his book Pretty Vacant, A History of UK Punk. Excerpts from the book were included in the Rolling Stone article Flashback, Nancy Spungen Found Dead at the Chelsea Hotel. Here is a short excerpt. One theory is that Rocket's Red Glare, the drug dealer who supplied the opiates that night, killed Spungen. According to author Phil Strongman in his book Pretty Vacant, A History of Punk, Spungen confronted Red Glare when he tried to steal cash from their hotel room, so he stabbed her in the stomach and split. Quote, Noticing Sid flat out and grey on the bed, Red Glare decided to help himself to a bit more of the couple's cash. Strongman writes, Nancy saw an attempted theft and flew at him nails flying and caught a bowie knife in her lower abdomen. Nancy slumped to the floor immediately. With no one standing in his way, Red Glare took everything but pocket change and left behind what he believed to be two corpses. Strongman continues that in January of 1978, Red Glare was heard confessing about the theft and murder at the punk rock club CBGB's. Quote, Rocket's Red Glare casually admitted to several fellow drinkers that it was actually he who'd robbed and stabbed Nancy Spungen and produced a handful of her blood-stained dollars to prove it. Continuing on with an article from the Daily Star, at the same time all cash from their room had been taken, it is claimed that Red Glare wanted to cover his tracks after killing Nancy by then taking out Sid. After arrest, suicide attempts, and jail, Vicious died on February 2nd at age 21, of a drug overdose. Red Glare supplied the drugs at the fateful party when Sid died of a heroin overdose, and it was later found that the drug was up to 90% pure compared with the regular 30 to 35% on New York streets. Others have come forward to back up the claim. One who wrote on social media said, quote, It was definitely Rocket's Red Glare. I used to live in the East Village, and I know people who had known him. He evidently bragged about it and wore it like a badge of honor. Another said, It's an open secret in New York that Red Glare and an accomplice went into their room to steal drugs, and when Nancy woke up in a drugged out haze and saw them trying to steal their stash, she freaked out and the two of them stabbed her. Continuing on with an excerpt from The Vicious Death of Nancy Spungen by Heather Monroe, others claim a man named Michael also came into and out of the room. No one seems to know his last name, only that Michael was also a resident of the Chelsea. Interestingly, Rocket's actual name is Michael Mora. Before Rockets died of drug-related illnesses in 2001, he openly bragged that he killed Nancy. Some say Rockets was being flippant, but had a habit of telling tall tales. But Rockets also had a wad of cash found with Nancy's purple hair tie, Sid and Nancy's money, as much as $25,000 was inexplicably missing when Nancy died. Thank you for spending time with me today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. 
please consider subscribing, giving the video a like, and hit the bell for future notifications. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe.